Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. In this dissection, you will be removing the head and reviewing some of the cross-sectional anatomy of the neck prior to removing the deep neck musculature. Here you see two sections which are taken really from the same side and for that reason we put them together mostly to orient you, but we can remove that. And here is the half of the neck. In review, here we have the visceral portion of the neck, the anterior, posterior, and lateral portions, the vertebral column, the visceral compartment, the trachea, the esophagus, a neurovascular region in here, the carotid sheath, and a bit of the thyroid gland can be located here. In the first part of this dissection, what we are going to do is to remove this posterior neck region and preserve this anterior section of the neck. We'll take advantage of a cleft which exists then behind sternocleidomastoid, which is located here, and in front of the deep neck musculature. That cleft will pass across in this direction and be joined on the opposite side. It will keep then the components of this neurovascular bundle, the carotid sheath components, with this anterior region. Now let's look at our specimen. You've now removed the head from the rest of the body and in cross section then we can see that here you have the spinal column at this point and here you can see a little bit in section a portion of the actual spinal cord. Now again we need to dissect or rather identify parts of the dissection that you have previously done. Here is sternocleidomastoid coming down in this fashion, fashion here. Uh, passing across it, you remember that we had a large nerve, the great auricular nerve, and in the posterior neck we have the trapezius and the muscles of the deep neck region. It is this group of muscles that we want to remove in an organized fashion and save as much of the neurovascular components that lie in here with the anterior portion of the neck. To do that, we need to reflect the trapezius, excuse me, sternocleidomastoid anteriorly and beneath it identify then the components of the carotid sheath. The most lateral component and largest but thin-walled is the internal jugular vein. Beneath it, the common carotid and the major neural component, the vagus nerve. These it can be easily reflected forward. And finally, one of the deep neck musculature associated nerves is the cervical sympathetic trunk. We want to make sure that the cervical sympathetic trunk remains with this anterior compartment as well. Now if we take and separate then, there is a cleft that exists behind sternocleidomastoid in front of this deep neck region. And one can just work with your finger in between here and open it up all the way to the base of the skull. If you look at this, you can now see that the Neurovascular components are here and here. The posterior portion of the visceral compartment is here, and the prevertebral area is here. Vertebral column itself, the bodies are right here. And this cleft that I'm putting my hand into then is the prevertebral cleft or space. It is continuous all the way down into the thorax, and we're going to use that as the means of removing this deep neck component from the rest of the head. 
we remove this deep neck mass now by beginning our cut deep to the sternocleidomastoid and we'll reflect that forward and then the deep neck muscles can be cut from the base of the skull in this fashion. It's important to keep the structures that we've identified forward and free and safe from our removal of this deep neck component. Now, if this cut is properly placed, it will be against the base of the skull and will carry itself all the way to form and magnum, and then final separation can be worked out by cutting through the various ligaments in this region, and that's what we'll be doing next. These ligaments may, in fact, be rather tough. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you'll actually be able to pass the scalpel blade down and release them. Other times, you may need to use a, a chisel in this position mostly as a pry to pull this vertebral column away from the base of the skull. We have now released those anterior ligaments and in fact the deep neck musculature can be brought out in block and you can see here then the sternocleidomastoid on one side, sternocleidomastoid on the other. If we turn it around we can see that the anterior or visceral compartment is lying here. Uh, in this area, you can see the sectioned cord at foramen magnum and the base then of where the vertebral column articulated with the base of the skull. In the neck itself, you can see the neurovascular components lying on either side of this visceral region. These then are the carotid sheaths as they go up and enter the base then of the skull. I'd like to next consider then the meninges and how you are oriented to that. As in the spinal cord, the brain too then is protected by three layers of meninges, a dura, arachnoid, and pia level. The pia matter and the arachnoid will not be studied in any particular detail. However, in the cranial region, you must remember that the dura has two layers, one which is periosteal and the other which is meningeal and is closely associated then with the surface of the brain. Now in your specimens, if you were remove the, roll back the scalp, this has already been done for you. In this particular specimen, when you remove the calivarium, we are going to find that a portion of the brain is still present. In your particular ones, the brain will have been removed and you will look down and see a specimen such as we'll be showing you in a minute. But this periosteal dura, then is fused with a meningeal dura in this region and in the areas in which it is separated you generate then what are known as the dural venous sinuses, spaces which exist then between the periosteal and meningeal dura. If we roll back this surface then of the combined periosteal and meningeal dura, we can see a feature that you will not have a chance to see in quite as nice an arrangement in your particular specimen. But here in the midline is the falx cerebri. It's a sickle-shaped septum of dura. It's a meningeal extension then between the two cerebral hemispheres. At its superior level then runs the superior sagittal sinus and at its inferior edge the inferior sagittal sinus. These then are going to reach into an area that is called the tentorum or the, of the cerebellum, which is going to be lying deep and in this region. This tents over then the cerebellum, dividing the cerebrum from that portion of the brain. Now I'd like to consider the inner aspect of the cranium the way you will see it in your particular specimen. This specimen is more like what you will be encountering in the laboratory in that the brain has been removed, the tentorium has at least been reflected to one side, if not totally removed. This then is the tentorium portion of it that came up. This would be a portion of the falx cerebri coming up, this then being tentorium, the space beneath 
that which was occupied by the cerebellum. Um, in be being generally oriented to this region, you have an anterior, middle, and the posterior cranial fossa then is covered over by the tentorium, and that is the posterior cranial fossa down in here. Now, at the points at which the septi of dura project into the brain, we're going to have reflections between the periosteal dura and the meningeal dura, so that there will be a space created, the dural venous sinus. The best example that we have here is one which we can open up. It runs along this region and is perhaps even better shown on the opposite side of this skull. And we'll look over here. Um, and that is the transverse sinus. You can see the pointer is opening up then a space that was created when the meningeal dura came up to form the tentorium, and that is then a venous space. Now, if I work along this, I can actually open up that sinus, and that's probably the best way of demonstrating it. You can see some of the coagulated blood, fixed blood in this region. You should identify all of these sinuses, incise them like this, and follow them through their dural courses. Now, running across the petrous portion of temporal bone, which is what we have here, you have the superior petrosal sinus. It is somewhat smaller than the transverse sinus, but it can be followed as being a continual sinus passing up into this region. This is an important portion of the brain, and I'd like to show you that now. It's important to dentistry because in this region, we have the cavernous sinus. You don't see a cavernous sinus very easily, but this portion is the meningeal dura. The periosteum is more closely applied to the bone so that there is a sinus here and here. They intercommunicate then across this region and anteriorly across here. If we lift up the optic nerves, which are what you can identify here, we'll find that there is a small depression behind them, right in this region. And this is a diaphragm of meningeal dura, the diaphragm celli, which is covering over the hypothesis that lies in the apophyseal fossa deep to this point. On either side of the optic nerve, another landmark that you should identify in your specimen is this internal carotid artery as it comes up at this point. And running in the sides of the cavernous sinus, which we'll be opening in the next dissection, are a series of cranial nerves which should be identified and maintained at least at this point. We can see here we've identified one of them, the optic nerve, which is the second cranial nerve. The third cranial nerve is this one. You can see it again here and a very small nerve which runs up in the edge of the tentorium and it's here. This is the fourth cranial nerve or the trochlear. If one removes and reflects those to the side rather and looks down on this slanted portion of the base which is called the clivus, one will find the sixth cranial nerve exiting the dura in this region, and that should also be preserved. And right underneath the tentorium, if I turn that to the edge, you will see the fifth cranial nerve. Now, this one seems to be hiding on this side, so let's look at it on this side. Here, the tentorium has been cut away, and you can see that this is the fifth cranial nerve stump. It's going to pass beneath the tentorial attachment then and splay out on the side of the cavernous sinus. These sinuses are easily located in the skull because they are also formed, as I mentioned before, between the meningeal and periosteal dura. Where it's in the periosteum, then it grooves the bone. And let's take a look at the skull now. Here, in the skull, 
we can see that the skull also shows grooving. The superior petrosal sinus that we showed you is located here, and you can see that it grooves this portion of the temporal bone. It's called the petrous ridge, and there's the groove for the superior petrosal sinus. It's coming toward the area we just talked about, the cavernous sinus. The cavernous sinus itself lying on either side of the apophyseal fossa. If we turn the skull so that we can see more of this bony modeling, one of the most outstanding ones in your skull that you will see is this one. This is the transverse sinus groove. It then will pass around and arch down in an S shape, the sigmoid sinus, as it heads down toward the jugular fossa or the opening for the internal jugular vein. So as you can see, you can review these sinuses well at home as well as in the laboratory because of the lines and demarcations that they leave on the skull itself. One final feature then of the dural venous sinuses is associated with the ventricular system of the brain. And that is that the, within the, the ventricular system of the brain, cerebral spinal fluid is produced. It must be reabsorbed into the venous volume, and that occurs in the superior sagittal sinus. On the specimen we looked at first, we can reflect the periosteum, the periosteal dura, and look inside the superior sagittal sinus, and that is what we can see here. Leading out from that sinus, then, are venous lacunae, and within the venous lacunae, we have small tufts of the underlying arachnoid layer which are going to penetrate in this region. These are called the arachnoid granulations. They make it a granular-like appearance in the superior sagittal sinus. It is through then this arachnoid granulation that the cerebral spinal fluid is finally reabsorbed into the venous system. The details of the ventricular system can be better studied in the laboratory using the models and section brains which are available to you there. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.